The scripture reading for today is taken from Exodus 12, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Now we're looking at the life of Moses in the book of Exodus. And we saw last week that at one point Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, asks uh, the question, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And what he's asking is this. He's saying, look, everybody has their own religion. Everyone has their own gods. Everyone has their own faith. Who is your God? Uh, What is so unique about your God, he's asking? What is so unique about your faith that I should embrace it? That's what he's saying to Moses. And there's probably no better answer to that question. What is so unique about this God? What is so unique about his ways and this faith than this passage, this famous passage, the Passover? Because those faiths that accept the biblical vision of ultimate spiritual reality, Judaism and Christianity, this is the center of it. For Jews, the Passover meal is the central thing that makes them who they are. And for Christians, a revised Passover meal, the Lord's Supper, is the central act of Christian worship. In other words, when Pharaoh asked the questions, what, is so, what makes this faith so unique? What makes this God so unique? Here it is, but look at what is at the center of it. Look at what is at the center of this thing. The bloody death of a helpless victim. There's no other religion like that. At the very center of the center of biblical faith, of the biblical vision of ultimate spiritual reality, is the bloody death of a helpless victim. Now, why? Why? What, why, and what does it mean? And, and now here's the answer. <clears throat> we need to look at this passage, which tells us about the offering up of the lamb. But in order to understand the passage, the account, we have to put it into the context of the story of the lamb, which is a Bible-long story that goes from the very beginning to the very end. And as a matter of fact, as I want to show you, the story of the Bible, actually, the narrative plot line of the Bible essentially is the narrative, the story of the lamb. So we want to understand the account of the offering of the lamb first. Then we need to put it in the context of the story, the whole story of the lamb. And then lastly, we need to take some time to do what John the Baptist said, which is behold the lamb. 
So let's look at the offering of the lamb, the story of the lamb, and the beholding of the lamb. Now, first of all, the offering of the lamb. What do we see in the passage? And here's what we see. First of all, God has called Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, over and over again <clears throat> to release the Hebrews from their grinding poverty and slavery into which the Egyptians had put them. And he, and he calls uh, Pharaoh to let them go, and Pharaoh refuses, and a series of plagues have come, which we looked at last week. Finally, the final stroke. And what is the final stroke? It's right here in verse 12. On that night, God says, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn. Now, what's interesting <clears throat> is there's another reference. It's not in this passage uh, that we printed for you. It's over in verse 23. And in 20, verse 23, it's Moses speaking to the Israelites about the Passover night, and he says this, but Moses said, the Lord will not let the destroyer enter your house and strike you down. The, the destroyer. Last week, we at great length, and therefore I cannot recapitulate, at great length, we talked about a simple, uh, you might say, fact or even law of the universe. And that is that when you violate God's design for creation or your design for your body or design for relationships, when you when you violate God's design, you unleash forces of disintegration and chaos. We said this is, this is always true, and it even happens now, even at, even at this level. If you overwork, if you make your career an idol, there's breakdown, right? There's, eventually there'll be physical breakdown and emotional breakdown and spiritual breakdown and relational family breakdown and all that sort of thing. If you just hold a grudge, if you just refuse to forgive somebody and you hold a grudge, doctors and counselors and common sense tells you there's breakdown, there's disintegration, uh, you know, social and spiritual and emotional and physical and so on. But when God says, that night the destroyer will come, what he is saying is, I have, as it were, scrolled ahead in time. And for one night, in one, at, on one night, in one place, eternal, divine, judgment day justice is coming down. There's going to be a tempor temporary, preliminary, but devastating judgment day. Not just the forces of destruction, disintegration, and chaos that are out there in general, that whenever you disobey, the, the design leads to disintegration and chaos. But for that one night, down will come the destroyer. Wow. A preliminary, temporary judgment day. And the second thing <clears throat> that God says is he speaks to the Israelites and he says this. Now, think about this. He says, I'm about to unleash the most inexorable, irresistible, unstoppable force in the universe the destroyer. It is going to go through the greatest military and political power that the world has ever seen, Egypt. It's going to go right through it like a knife through hot butter. And there's only one thing that will protect you. There's only one way you can face this, the ultimate force of the universe, a lamb. A lamb? I'm going to be protected by the ultimate force in the universe by Fluffy and Muffy, the weakest, meekest, mildest kind of creature possible. And God says, yes, the only way you're going to be able to face this ultimate force in the universe is I want you to kill a lamb, eat it with your family, and put <clears throat> the blood on the doorposts. And that's the Passover. Now, obviously, this is at very best confounding, and at very worst, deeply offensive to the average modern person. And the only way that it will become less confounding, hopefully, uh, certainly, and less offensive, hopefully, is if you put it in the context of what I already referred to as the Bible long story of the Lamb. In other words, this particular passage that we read, as famous as it is, will make no sense unless you put it into the context, because the story of the Lamb is, a, is an enormously long and astounding story 
with many chapters. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's, let me go back and show you what the chapters are, at least some of them. First of all, the very first chapter in the story of the Lamb in the Bible is the story of Abraham and Isaac. Genesis 22, I, Abraham has a son he loves, Isaac, and in Genesis 22, God, he hears God speak to him, and God says, offer up your only son as a sacrifice to me. And modern people believe that Abraham must have felt, obviously, anguish, and it's clear from the story he feels anguish. But modern people say, oh, I know why he's so anguished. Modern people say, he must have thought that was a monstrous command. He must have thought that was an insane command. And the answer is no. If you believe that, it's because you don't understand the historical and cultural context of Abraham. There's a man named John Levinson, who's a Jewish scholar who teaches at Harvard, has written a book called The Death and Resurrection of the Beloved Son that does a wonderful job in a very scholarly way of putting it into context. And so we actually have a pretty good idea of what Abraham was thinking, and it's not that. See, here's the context. Ancient people, in ancient cultures, you did not have aspirations for individual prominence, individual prosperity, individual success. That's not what you hope for. That's not what you aspire to. You aspired for the success and the prominence and the prosperity of your family. You didn't think in such individualistic terms. In ancient cultures, you wanted your family to succeed. And secondly, in ancient cultures, if some member of the family failed or acted in a very shameful way, the entire family was responsible. If one person acted shamefully, that shame belonged to everyone. Now, see, modern Americans and Western people, and especially Americans, probably even more than Europeans, we are the most radically individualistic people. This is the most radically individualistic culture ever. What we feel like is if some member of my family acts in a shameful way, that's them. That's not me. I'm my own person. I'm setting my own course for life, and I don't want to be held responsible for what they have done. I'm not responsible for what they have done. I am my own person. I am deciding what, who I want to be. Now, now, I think it's going to become clear, and I, I'm sure a lot of you already have recognized this, that this is an unbalanced position. Our radically individualistic American Western culture is unbalanced about this. Uh, as you get older, one of the most disconcerting sort of things is you come to realize you are much, much, much more, inescapably, much more of a product of your family than you thought. What you are, both good and bad, is not as attributable completely to you. Much of it is attributable, good and bad, to your family, to what they did and what they didn't do, in you, with you, beside you. You know, uh, after the Columbine atrocity, even in the most radically individualistic culture in history, it was virtually un impossible not to look at the families of the two guys who did all the atrocities and say, there's responsibility there, either active for what they did with the kids or at least passive for their neglect. I mean, it was universal, it was unavoidable. They felt it, everybody else felt it. In other words, the idea that you're an individual and there's no relationship between you and the rest of your family is probably unbalanced. Most cultures, most centuries have had a more balanced understanding of individual and collective responsibility. Having said that, let's go back. In ancient cultures who didn't think of themselves as individuals but as families and at a time in which the firstborn got the whole estate, God sent a message that was unmistakably clear to them, but it's opaque to us. In the book of Exodus, verse 20, chapter 22, in the book of Numbers, chapter 3 and 8, there was a message that God sent which was opaque to us, and here's what it is. He said over and over again in the uh, Mosaic legislation, the life of every firstborn is mine. The life of every firstborn is mine unless you redeem. So every year they had to put up so many shekels. There was a redemption price on the head of the firstborn of every family. Now, <laughs> their lives are forfeit unless they're redeemed. That's what, that's what the law of Moses said. Now, to us that's completely opaque, but it was an unmistakable message to ancient people who immediately understood. Because, see, 
the fir- in the firstborn, all their hopes were embodied. All their hopes for themselves, for their family, was embodied in the firstborn. And so God was sending an unmistakable message, and that is that there is a debt over every family on the face of the earth. There is a debt of sin. There is a debt that is owed God on every family on the face of the earth. Your firstborn are liable for the way in which you're living, and their lives are forfeit unless they're redeemed. Now, that doesn't make any sense to individualistic Americans, but you begin to understand. And what that means, and it's very, very important to understand, is that when God said to Abram, offer up your firstborn as an offering to me, if God had said to Abram, if Abram had heard the words, go into the tent and kill Sarah, Abraham rightly so would have said, I'm having a hallucination, or that's a demon, because God would not call me to do something absolutely at variance with his righteousness and with his word and his will. But when God said, offer up your firstborn, Abraham did not say, what a monster. Abraham realized that God was calling in the debt, that God was doing something that God had a right to do, that Isaac was about to die for Abram's sins. Oh, Abram struggled, of course, but he didn't say, how can you be so unjust? What Abraham was saying in his heart was, how can you be both just, which you have a right to be? You're a just God, but how can you be both just and still a God of grace? Because you've promised great things to happen through me and my son in, your, in the world. How can you be both just and justifier of those who believe? How can you be both just and a gracious God? How can you be a God of both of justice and of the God of the promise? How can you do it? And you see, as he was walking up the mountain, the emotional hot peak of the account of Abram and Isaac in Genesis 22, comes to verse 7 and 8, where Isaac looks down and he says, Father, the wood, the fire, the knife, but where's the lamb? Where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham looks at his son and says, God will provide a lamb, my son. And what Abraham is saying is, I hope with all my being that you will not have to die for my sins. Though, there's, though that is just, I, with all my being, hope that God will provide a lamb so my little lamb won't have to die. Now, a lot of people say, I really object to this. I don't believe this. Now, by the way, that's primitive and obscene, I've had people tell me. And... Uh, Pardon me, but calling an idea a name doesn't disprove it. What are the objections to it? And I think there's two objections. This whole idea that there's a debt of sin and that we all deserve judgment. There's two objections. Let me give you the two of them. The first objection goes like this. They say, well, I don't really believe. I, I think you're extreme when you say that every single family, everybody on the face of the earth is, cannot pass judgment, that, that every single person on the face of the earth has this debt and, and is not living right. I don't believe that. And a lot of people say, I believe that I'm supposed to find my own standards and that I have the right to determine what's right or wrong for me. Okay, let's be postmodern for a moment. Okay? Let's say there are no transcendent moral absolutes that everybody else, that everybody has to be judged according to whether they, you believe them or not. Let's, just, let, let's not say anything about that. Let's be postmodern. And let's just say that around your neck, there's an invisible tape recorder and uh, the only thing that tape recorder ever picks up are things you say other people ought to do. It only picks up standards that you call people to ascribe to. In other words, it only picks up your moral standards. If at the end of your life we were to take that tape recorder off and say, let's evaluate your life. There's not a person on the face of the earth that could live up even to that. Let's not go to the Ten Commandments. Let's not go to the Golden Rule. Let's just go to your own standards that you have chosen. There is no one on the face of the earth that can face an evaluation of how they've lived their lives. No one has lived properly. No one, no one can pass any kind of moral evaluation of any sort. Okay, well, some people say, all right, all right, okay, okay. But here's the thing I don't understand, this idea of a debt, a debt that has to be paid for. Surely, if there is a God, 
goes the objection. God can just forgive it. Surely if there is a God, God, God can forgive. He can just forgive, can't he? Listen carefully. The answer is no. What I mean is, no, he can't just forgive without payment. And I beg you to think about this with me for a minute. This is very important understanding this whole thing. First of all, let me ask you psychologically. If someone really, really wrongs you, really wrongs you, what happens? I would suggest, and I think you unavoidably, there's a debt. There's something between you and the person who has seriously wronged you. And it can't be wished away. It can't be ignored. It's, I'm gonna, it's a debt. And I'll show you what I mean. There's only two things you can do with a debt. The only way to get rid of the barrier, on the one hand, you can make them pay it down. In other words, you can hurt them, you can berate them, you can find ways of making them suffer, you can exclude them, there's all sorts of things. And as you see them paying it, you sense the debt being paid down. At a certain point, it's gone. Now, by the way, the Bible says if you do it that way, if that's how you do it, if you make people pay for what they have done, it'll turn you into a hard person. It'll dehumanize you, but that's not our subject today. Nevertheless, if you, you can make them pay it, or the other thing to do is you say, well, why don't you just forgive? Okay, that's, that's the right thing to do. But let me tell you what forgiveness is made of. To forgive them means that when I want to hurt them, I don't. When I want to slice up their reputation in talking to other people, I don't. <laughs> when I want to just think hateful thoughts and about how they have done these awful things and what awful people they are, I don't. And if I do that, if I refuse to do that, if I do that, you'll find as time goes on, your anger slowly subsides. Why? Because you're paying the debt down yourself. You are paying it down. It's costly. It's difficult. But the fact of the matter, it doesn't go away. There is no way emotionally, psychologically, when a real wrong is done, they can just be forgiven. Somebody has to pay the debt. They have to pay it. You have to pay it. Somebody must pay it or the barrier is there. Okay, let's think about it sociologically instead of psychologically. Let's just say we find a man, definitely he has done it, and he's guilty of some horrible crime. Rape, murder, serial rape and murder. And what if a judge says, well, he's sorry for it. I don't, let's let him go free. Right away, the reason there would be outrage is this. If he doesn't pay, society will pay, right? See, to let him go free means, number one, the victim's lives are devalued. In other words, if there's no payment, it means that their lives, the things they've lost, are worthless. Number two, society, if he goes free, society will pay because this will just go on. It'll just go on. There's no deterrence. This person will go on perhaps doing it or other people will go on doing it because it wasn't punished. In other words, either he pays or we pay. Psychologically, sociologically, there's no such thing as a real serious wrong that can be forgiven without payment. Somebody has to pay it. Somebody has to experience the pain. Somebody has to bear the price. Somebody. And if it's true that even we, in spite of our rhetoric, we cannot avoid that. There's, never, there's no such thing as a wrong that can just be forgiven without somebody paying. If even we, with our imperfect and fuzzy moral senses, if we sense that, how much more would God sense that at the cosmic level? And therefore, what this means is, Abraham knows this. Abraham is not a modern American individualist. He knows this. He's not naive about these things. He knows that God created us, God sustained us, and therefore, number one, we owe it to him to live for him completely, but we don't. Secondly, we owe it to our neighbor to treat them the way we want to be treated ourselves, but we don't. We don't even come close. And as a result, none of us have lived the way we should. These are serious wrongs we've done against God and our neighbor, and as a result, there's a debt, and God has the right to call for it. But at the last minute, God says, Abraham, don't do it. And yet the lamb never shows up. The chapter, Abraham's chapter ends and we say, well, this is, makes us feel good, but wait a minute, there's a, there's a few unanswered questions. There's a debt, but the lamb never shows up. There's a ram who gets caught in the thicket, and the ram is sacrificed, but more as a thank offering, because the fact of the matter is, there's a debt. God has the right to the payment, 
but it doesn't get made. So where's the lamb? Chapter 2, Moses. Again, God claims the life of the firstborn. Now you're beginning to understand it? Can you get out of your own culture and historical moment enough to understand it? He claims the right of the firstborn again, and again, he says the only hope is a lamb. But now, in the Passover chapter of this story, we see two extremely interesting principles played out, and the two principles are, I'll call it, the spiritual, the, the principle of spiritual egalitarianism and the principle of spiritual substitutionism. Egalitarianism and substitutionism, and they're astounding. Number one, egalitarianism. Not in this passage, but over a little later in chapter 12, verse 22, God says to the Israelites, after you've put the blood on your door, not one of you shall go out of your house until the morning. Do you know what that means? It, you know, if you're reading this chapter, it goes right by and you, and you don't even think about it. You know what this means? It's an astounding thing. What he is trying to say is the destroyer is not coming just for Egyptians. The destroyer is no respecter of persons. And this is what's amazing. He says, look, Israelites, you are the oppressed. They are the oppressor. You worship the true God. They worship idols. And yet in yourself, if you were to meet judgment tonight, you would find whether it's on the Ten Commandments, whether it's by the Golden Rule, whether it's by the tape recorder standard, you would be lost tonight. In yourself, you are absolutely no better than the Egyptians. In the final spiritual analysis, the, 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 the most the morally ethical, the biblically righteous, the, uh, you know, the doctrinally proper, he says, if you go out tonight and you try to meet judgment on your own and you do not sit under the blood, if you go out there on your own, your race, your pedigree, your ethnicity, your, your religion, your beliefs, your doctrine, your ethical behavior, none of that will help you. You will be as lost as the people in the world that you disdain the most, the Egyptians. And that is an amazing statement. So there's the principle of spiritual egalitarianism. Secondly, there's the principle of spiritual substitutionism. What is the hope? Listen, in every single house in Egypt that night, I hate to say it this way, but I've got to do it just to be vivid here. There was either a dead son or a dead lamb. It was one or the other. In other words, the lamb got what the son deserved. The lamb was a substitute. The lamb paid the debt so that the firstborn did not have to pay the debt for the the, uh, family. And every firstborn son in every Hebrew home, looked at the table and saw the lamb and said, the only reason I'm not dead is because that is. Now, there are people today that don't say that the whole principle of substitution is not credible to them, but I would just beg you, hopefully I've done this well enough, I've, I've created the context for this, this urge, this appeal. I would appeal to you to consider whether it is not your, your, your ethnocentrism, your cultural narrowness, your feeling like the American understanding of legal responsibility is the only one, the radical individualism of the culture in which I live is obviously the right one. I would like you to try to get out of yourself for a moment. <laughs> We've already talked about the fact that our culture is actually kind of, uh, you know, unbalanced in this way. The simple fact is we know there's a debt. Emotionally, psychologically, socially, there's a debt. We have not been living as we should. And just as the guilt of some, you know, can be transferred to one in a family, that one can pay the price for the family. The principle of substitution is not credible to us largely because our American individualism kind of blinds us to it. But would you recognize, in, would, you, would you for a moment say, maybe what most cultures and most centuries have understood and what the Bible says, maybe it's true, that it is possible that rather than me paying my debt, someone in solidarity with me pays it for me. I mean, it makes sense. It's a beautiful thing. And most people, most places can understand it. Americans have a lot of trouble doing it. Would you just try to get out of your culture for a moment and recognize the fact 
that this is what the claim is. When you put the spiritual of, uh, when you put egalitarianism and substitutionism together, you have an amazing statement, and that's what this is. You know what this statement is? This passage is saying this is not the last chapter. You know why? Yes, the Israelites are politically and uh, economically the victims. And yet when God says, but if you go out from underneath the, the blood of the lamb and face judgment on your own, you will be smitten tonight. When God says that, what he's actually trying, what he's actually saying to them is even though I'm delivering you tonight, it's not the ultimate deliverance you need. You are still in a debt of sin. You need a deeper deliverance than the one tonight. As important as the one is tonight, as incredible as this one is, you need another one. As important as this lamb is, you need another lamb. As important as this deliverance is, you need a deeper one, a more radical salvation. Because you have a bigger debt. You have a bigger problem. You have a different, diff, a, a bigger and deeper kind of spiritual bondage. Scroll forward to chapter 3. Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, celebrates the Passover meal. He asks his disciples to come together and say, let's celebrate the Passover tonight. So they all get together at the Passover. And when Jesus Christ stands up, there are two enormous shocks. Shock number one, when Jesus Christ stands up to begin to speak, everybody said, okay, he is in the place of the Father. And the Passover meal, there's a presider. And the presider's job is to stand up and explain the meal. If you go through the rest of chapter 12 and 13, it actually gives the presider uh, Exodus 12 and 13, it gives the presider some ideas on this. He's supposed to get up and he's supposed to uh, explain the meal. So Jesus Christ gets up, and what do we expect to hear him say? What did the disciples expect to hear him say? They expect to hear him say, this is the bread of our affliction. This is the bread of affliction. Our ancestors suffered in the wilderness so that we could be free. But instead, he gets up and says, this is my body. This bread is my body. And what he's saying is, this is the bread of my affliction that I am going to suffer to give you the ultimate freedom. Freedom not just from physical and uh, political and economic bondage, but from sin and death itself. And that's the first shock. Because when he says, this is my body in the place of the presider at the Passover meal, he is saying, now it's my suffering that's going to be the ultimate liberation for you. And then here's the second shock. When he stood up, the disciples looked down, and there's three things you have at a Passover meal. You have the unleavened bread, and there's Jesus breaking the bread. And you have the four cups of wine, and there's Jesus Christ pouring out the cup, obviously. And then there's the lamb. There's no reference to a lamb. There's no lamb. What kind of Passover meal is this, says the disciples. There's no lamb on the table. There's no lamb on the table. You know why? Because the lamb was at the table. The lamb was deliberately removed from the Passover meal because Jesus Christ is saying, tonight, I am the lamb. My death, he's saying, is the central event to which all of the history of God's relationship to the world has been moving. Tonight, I'm giving you that ultimate salvation that even Moses understood that the, that Passover was pointing to when God said, I'll take you out politically, but if you get out from under the blood of the lamb, you still have a debt of sin on you. I'm removing it tonight. In other words, he says, this night is really a night unlike all other nights. And this is the reason why John the Baptist looked at Jesus one day, and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. In other words, John the Baptist was saying, I get it. I get it. Our firstborn sons were not saved because of the death of some woolly little quadrupeds, no matter how cute. Our firstborn were saved because God has given up his firstborn. See, that's the answer to Abram. God was saying, Abram, I'm going to walk up my, a mountain with my son, and I'm going to lay the wood on him. And nobody will be able to say, stop. And I have a, Abram, the reason that your only beloved son won't have to die is because mine did. And one commentator puts it this way. 
When the ultimate beloved child cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The father paid the price in his silence. Behold the perfect lamb. John 19, 33 pointed out that Jesus' bones were not broken. Why? Because it had to be a lamb without spot and blemish. Matthew 27 pointed out that Jesus died just at twilight. Why? Because the lamb was to be slain at twilight. The chapter of the lamb, Abraham's first chapter of the lamb said, there's a debt. Moses' chapter of the lamb said, but a substitute can pay for it. And Jesus' chapter said, it's me. It's God's only son. And, of course, there's one more chapter, you know. Go to the book of Revelation where the lamb is on the throne. Now, let's close like this. Remember when John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God? Do you know what that means? Beholding the Lamb of God means don't, he he doesn't just mean there's the Lamb of God, you know? Behold the Lamb of God means think, realize it, take it in. Look, 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 see? He's not just saying, oh, there's the Lamb of God. He says, think about it, realize it, grasp it, do you? If you are exploring Christianity, if if you're somebody who's sort of looking into Christianity, the one question I get over the years in New Yorkers, and it's an absolutely natural question for people who are exploring this, I do not understand why Jesus had to die. I do not understand why Jesus had to die. It doesn't make any sense to me. <clears throat> Behold the Lamb of God in three ways. Here's the answers. Number one, do not let your American individualism obscure what the Bible says and what most cultures believe, and that is because you have wronged God and your neighbor... There is a debt that must be paid. Don't let, any, don't let that be obscured. There's a debt that must be paid. And when the ultimate beloved son cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The father paid the debt in his silence. That's the first reason Jesus had to die. Secondly, if Je- Jesus had to die, if you don't see that Jesus had to die, it makes no sense of the accounts of his life. Look at the Gospels and you'll see in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus crying out, almost losing it. Look at Jesus, look at the Gospel accounts, Jesus Christ on the cross crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you know what you see? Here's what you see. If you were making up a faith, if you were making up a religion and you were just fabricating stories about the founder of your religion, about his life, you would never in a million years put those things in. Never. You'd never have him crying out, never saying, oh Lord, can I get off the hook in the Garden of Gethsemane? Never. You'd never make that up. Thousands of people, men and women, have faced executions better than that. So since you would never make those up, they must have happened. And since they must have happened or they never would have been written, there's no other way to account for them. He must have been forsaken. God must have forsaken him. But since he was forsaken and he was, by all accounts, the most wonderful man who ever lived, his life was so wonderful, why would he have been forsaken? He must have been in our place. You get that? He, he, he must have suffered and cried out. And therefore, he must have been forsaken. And therefore, he must have been your substitute. And if you don't believe that Jesus Christ had to die for you, if you say, like a lot of people in New York say, I believe in a God who just loves us. I don't believe in a God of wrath who Jesus Christ had to assuage through his propitiatory death. I don't believe, I just believe in a God who loves. Ironically, With all due respect, a God of more wrath than yours is necessarily a God of more love than yours. It's one thing to have somebody say, I love you. It's another thing to really show it. I have never felt more loved in my life. A lot of people said they loved me when I got sick. And now all kinds of people, my family, you, church, I've never been more loved in my life. You know why? Because I never had more people doing things for me. A God who says, I love you, but you don't have Jesus, you don't have the cross, who just says, I love you, it's not never going to electrify you, it's never going to change you, you're never going to be transformed by that, you have to have a God who shows. And therefore, ironically, the God of the Bible, the God of more wrath than your generic God, is a God of more love. Why did Jesus have to die? It's the only way to make sense of the historical accounts, the only way, by, only. number two, the only way to be transformed and the only way to deal with the dead. And some of you say, well, I am a Christian, and if you are a Christian, then here's what it means to behold the Lamb of God. Real quickly, behold the Lamb of God. If you look at what he's done, it'll transform your attitude toward other people. Even a Hebrew is no better than an Egyptian. If you buy this understanding of the Passover God, the the God of the cross, you realize that? 
you are no better than anyone else. It totally transforms your view of others. I've had people say, well, if you think you have the truth, that's going to make you an oppressive religion. Well, it all depends on what you think the truth is. What is the truth? The truth is the cross, the lamb. The truth is Jesus Christ dying for people who didn't believe in him. And if you see that, it makes you, it makes you know that you are no better than the people that you disdain. Only in him are you loved. You just think about that. So if you take the cross in and the Passover in, it'll radically transform your way of looking at others. It'll radically transform your way of looking at glory and achievement. Huh? In New York, glory and achievement is, a, is acquiring. The cross says glory and achievement is serving, is giving, is giving away. Radically changes your whole understanding of life. Thirdly, it radically changes your view of suffering because the, the, the most undeserved suffering in the history of the world the most apparently senseless suffering in the history of the world worked out to the most good. And that's going to completely change your attitude toward your own suffering. So some of you say, okay, if I really beheld the Lamb of God, my attitude toward others would be totally different. My attitude toward my life would be totally different. My suffering would be totally different. And you say, but it's not. Well, just remember one more thing. You should eat the Lamb with others. Fellowship groups, you eat the lamb with others. Christianity is an eternal Passover meal in which you get together with other Christians, other people who have had the same experience, and you say, why did this happen? What does it mean? And you behold the lamb of God together until it sinks in and you're transformed. Do you know, if you'd stopped an Israelite in the desert of Sinai, and you said, what are you guys, and who, what are you doing? And you know what they would have said? They said, well, I was an alien in a foreign land under penalty of death but I took shelter under the blood of the lamb. And even though uh, uh, morally and racially and ethically I could not save myself, I was saved. And now I've been brought out and God is in our midst. And even though I know looking around here, this is a desert and a wilderness, he's, on, he's taken me to the promised land. And do you realize that that's exactly what a Christian says? Exactly. Because everything in the history of the world, everything in the history of the Bible, all climaxed on the day that Jesus Christ became the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us to understand why Jesus died, to understand why Jesus had to die. And we thank you that because we behold him as a lamb, we are new people, utterly new. Our attitude toward others our attitude toward ourselves, our attitude and our, our relationship to the world, our suffering, the circumstance of our life, everything is radically transformed. But we have to admit as Christian friends, brothers and sisters here this morning, we have to admit that we don't live in accordance with that because we don't behold it deeply enough. And we pray that you would teach us how to eat the meal as it were together in community, telling each other what this means until we are transformed into the likeness of your Son in whose name we pray. Amen. For more of this series and other resources from Timothy Keller and Redeemer Presbyterian Church, please visit www.gospelinlife.com. The Passover. Because <clears throat> those faiths that accept the biblical vision of ultimate spiritual reality, Judaism and Christianity, this is the center of it. For Jews, the Passover meal is the central thing that makes them who they are. And for Christians, a revised Passover meal, the Lord's Supper, is the central act of Christian worship. In other words, when Pharaoh asked the questions, what, is so, what makes this faith so unique? What makes this God so unique? Here it is, but look at what is at the center of it. Look at what this, at, is at the center of this thing, the bloody death of a helpless victim. There's no other religion like that. At the very center of the center of biblical faith, of the biblical vision of ultimate spiritual, spiritual reality, is the bloody death of a helpless victim. Now, why? What, why? And what does it mean? And, and now, here's the answer. <clears throat> we need to look at this passage, which tells us about the offering up of the Lamb. But in order to understand the passage, the account, 
we have to put it into the context of the story of the Lamb, which is a Bible-long story that goes from the very beginning to the very end. And as a matter of fact, as I want to show you, the story of the Bible actually, the narrative plot line of the Bible essentially is the narrative, the story of the Lamb. So we want to understand the account of the offering of the Lamb first. Then we need to put it in the context of the story, the whole story of the Lamb. And then lastly, we need to take some time to do what John the Baptist said, which is behold the Lamb. So let's look at the offering of the lamb, the story of the lamb, and the beholding of the lamb. Now, first of all, the offering of the lamb. What do we see in the passage? And here's what we see. First of all, God has called. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Now, we're looking at the life of Moses in the book of Exodus, and we saw last week that at one point Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, asks uh, the question, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And what he's asking is this. He's saying, look, everybody has their own religion. Everyone has their own gods. Everyone has their own faith. Who is your God? Uh, What is so unique about your God, he's asking? What is so unique about your faith that I should embrace it. That's what he's saying to Moses. And there's probably no better answer to that question. What is so unique about this God? What is so unique about his ways and this faith than this passage, this famous passage? The scripture reading for today is taken from Exodus 12, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are 